Sorry. So I'm going to do that again, right? Otherwise, the others will miss it. Okay, let's go back. Right. So from the beginning, uh, let me go through it very fast. Uh, Corinthians compares the, the church to a body, and each body has a different parts, and each part has a different function. And um, each, each function works together as a whole, right? So just like that, the, the body has different functions, and each function works together as a whole for the uh, for the for the uh, for so that the body can function right well now in uh, in the body talking about our physical body uh, each part has a spiritual meaning like i said just now the feet represent according to paul in the books of book of romans the act of preaching the gospel right it's called the gospel of peace so your feet represent preaching the gospel the mouth represents teaching for example, when Jesus taught many times, the Bible says that he opened his mouth and taught in parables. So the mouth represents teaching. Hands represent touch, kindness, caring uh, for church members, for others to reach out and touch somebody, right? So the hands represent the practical Christian life. Today, this evening, we are going to talk about one uh, of these body parts that represents symbolically speaking, uh, uh, something spiritual, right? We're referring to the eyes of the body and the eyes of the body, what do they represent when it comes to the church? Like we were just going to read, uh, 1 Samuel 9, 9 uh, gives us a glimpse into their meanings of what the eyes represent. Esther, would you like to read that again? Yes, 1 Samuel 9, 9. Formerly in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, he spoke thus, Come, let us go to the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was formerly called a seer. Okay, so we see with our eyes, right? So a seer sees, right? Now Isaiah 29, 10 also gives us another glimpse into what eyes represent spiritually. Isaiah 29, 10. For the Lord has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, namely the prophets, and he has covered your heads, namely the seers. Okay, so what that text is saying is there was no prophetic voice, right? So in Israel, notice that the eyes are identified with the prophetic gift. Now remember, we are talking about the sanctuary, right? So the sanctuary is talking about the prophetic gift. Now, now perhaps uh, the, the, this reason um, why we are told this is found in Proverbs 29, 18, because it says there, where there is no vision, the people perish, right? So one of the defects of the end time church, according to Revelation 3, 14 to 22, is the fact that the Laodicean church is blind. Remember that? So what must that mean that the Laodicean church is blind? Is it possible that the church of Laodicea, God's last church, is blind because she refuses to listen to the prophetic gift that God has given her in these last days? Is it just possible that the blindness of the Laodicean church is due to her rejection of the prophetic voice that God has given in the person of Ellen G. White? Right? Certainly, God has given a precious message. We're going to find out very clearly in detail from the Bible today, right? How Mrs. White is considered a prophet and why we call her a prophet, right? A precious message, the Seventh-day Adventist Church through the ministry of Mrs. White. But how can we be certain that she was called of God to be the eyes of this remnant church? How can we be certain that in these last days, God has given the prophetic gift to his church. Today in our study, we are going to notice that God raised up a gift, the gift of prophecy in these last days at the right time, with the right message, at the right place, with the right people. 
right? So we are going to pursue only one avenue of this today, this evening, that will help us to see that she was raised up at just the right time with just the right message for just the right people. All this is from the Bible, right? So hold on there. Now, God has a more, more, modus operandi, mode of operation, right? Now, in this study, we are going to analyze several time prophecies of the Bible. All these time prophecies are found in the Old Testament. They originate in the Old Testament. The first three, we're going to talk about five, actually. The first three point to events that already transpired in the Old Testament, during Old Testament times. The last two point to events that, will, that occurred in the New Testament times. Now, each of these time prophecies, in each of these time prophecies, we find that there is a common modus operandi, that is mode of operation, that God uses to convey the reliability of his message. His method of operation is as follows. Right? So we're going to see if we can be certain that in these last days, God has raised up in his church the gift of prophecy, right? That is what we are going to find out. Now, all of these five prophecies had some common denominators, right? All these five prophecies had, a, had common denominators. Uh, the first thing that God does is that he calls a prophet and he imparts a prophetic message to this prophet. Now, that message is a message uh, to do with judgment, right? So God calls a prophet, imparts a message to that prophet. The message is one of judgment. Now, connected to this message of judgment is a time prophecy, right? A prophecy that has to do with a time period. And when God raises up that prophet, the message that he gives to that prophet is not present truth for that day or age. It's not present truth for that day or age. In other words, even though God gives the message to that prophet, the message is not for his or her time, right? So the first is he calls a prophet, he imparts a message to the prophet. The message is one of judgment. A link to this message is a time prophecy. That message is not present truth for that time, the time of the prophet. Now, the interesting thing is that when this time period, the time prophecy comes to an end or is about to come to an end, God raises up another prophet, right? And he imparts to that prophet the same message that he gave the first prophet, his blue, the, in the blue slide, right? It's a message of judgment, right? And he tells the prophet the time period, right, that he gave to the first prophet. God tells them that the time period has been fulfilled or is about to be fulfilled. In other words, the second prophet makes a message of the first prophet present truth. Now, remember, this was not present truth, but to the second prophet, it becomes present truth. It's going to happen in his or her day. And interesting enough, each time that the second prophet in the sequence rises, he draws out and leads a remnant, a faithful remnant to God. Okay. So first God calls a prophet, he imparts a message to that prophet. The message is one of judgment. Linked to the message is a time prophecy. That's a time prophecy God gives. And the message is not present truth to that time. Then when the time is coming to an end, the time prophecy is coming to an end or is, is about to end, God calls up and raises up another, calls another prophet, imparts the same message, right? That he gave to the first one. The message is still the same. It's one of judgment. The, the message explains that the time prophecy has ended or is about to end. And then the message becomes present truth, right? To that prophet, the second prophet. And the second prophet draws out a remnant, right? Guides out a remnant by the mission of the prophet. Okay, he says, are those two slides clear? Mm. Right. Now, what, what these um, time prophecies that God gave, these prophecies that God gave, were no measly events, right? We will find that these time prophecies did not point to insig insignificant events in human history. We will find that they relate to great events of salvation, uh, salvation's history. For example, we're going to notice uh, the first prophet that ever rose fits this method, method that God uses, right? So 
calling off the first prophet, right? The global flood in Noah's day, call of Abraham, exodus of Israel from Egypt, Babylonian captivity, baptism and death of the Messiah, and close of probation for the Jewish theocracy, and the beginning of the final judgment in heaven on October 22, 1844. Now, these are the time prophecies, right? All these critical, critically important events were for, salva were for salvation, right? And are included in this method that God uses to operate. So let's go to the first one. The first prophet who was explicitly mentioned in the Bible was Enoch. Now, how do we know that? We are told in Jude, Jude has only one chapter, uh, verses 14 and 15. Someone likes to read that, Jude 14 and 15. Now Enoch, the seven from Adam, prophesy about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Okay, so Enoch was the first prophet, right? And he was given a message of judgment. Notice prophesied, so he must have been a prophet, right? When it says prophesied, uh, only prophets prophesied. God gives his message to Enoch, the first prophet of the Bible, and it is a message of judgment. Now the question is, when was this message that God gave to Enoch fulfilled? The fact is that it was not fulfilled in the days of Enoch. It, is, it was not present truth for the days of Enoch that God was going to come to execute judgment, right? Actually, it's fulfilled in two specific points of time. The first is the second coming of Jesus but also in an event that prefigures and illustrates the second coming of Jesus. Notice um, Matthew 24, verses 37 and 39. Someone like to read that. But this event, Jesus specifically uh, mentions, Matthew 24 is a chapter where Jesus is explaining end time events, and he mentions this. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. So Jesus compares these two events, the destruction of the whole world by a flood and the destruction of the whole world at the second coming of Christ. So Enoch was actually prophesying about two events. He was prophesying of the ungodliness of society before the flood, which would be bringing, which would bring the destruction of the, um, the world then, right? The flood would bring the destruction of the world. And he was also referring to the wickedness of the world immediately before the second coming of Jesus Christ, right? So Enoch gets a, God calls a prophet, gives him a message, the message is of judgment. He gives him now let's, we will come to the time prophecy. And then when the time prophecy, it was not present truth for Enoch's time, right? It was not um, present truth for his time, right? Now concerning the wickedness of the world, we are told in Genesis 6, 5 uh, and 11 to 13, uh, what the world was like in Noah's days. Someone likes to read that? The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The earth also was corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Okay. 
Sounds like a description of the wickedness that God showed to Enoch, right? The first prophet. So Enoch was describing Christ's coming to destroy the world of its wickedness at the second coming. But he was also describing the destruction of the world for its wickedness by the flood in the days of Noah. Now, neither of these events took place during Enoch's time, right? So this message was not present for his generation. So we find that God gave Enoch this message and it was a message of judgment, right? Now, now where is the time prophecy in this message, right? You may be probably wondering where the time prophecy is. Is there a time prophecy connected to this message that God gave Enoch? that pointed to the destruction of the world by a flood. Now listen to this very interesting thing. Huh? The answer is yes, but you have to look beneath the surface of scripture to find it. Now, in order to answer this question, uh, we need to appeal to the significance of names. More than 75 times in the Bible, in the book of Genesis, the significance of names is underlined. Right? God emphasizes the importance of names. In names, in Genesis, names aren't simply given because they are names. Right? Names have very important meanings and significance. For example, Jacob. Jacob means surplanter. He said what he did? He sure did surplant his brother, right? Right. But then when he fought with the angel and prevailed, what did what did the uh, God gave him, God gave him a change of name, right? Change it to Israel, of God. So the question is, what does Enoch's son's name mean? What does the name of Enoch's son's name mean? Let's go to Genesis 5, 21. Who was Enoch's son? Enoch lived 65 years and beget Methuselah. Now we know Methuselah is a, is a name that we all know from kindergarten, uh, because we know that Matthew Salah was the oldest man who lived on the earth, right? Now, the interesting thing about the name is that the name is composed of two Hebrew words, Mut, which is found in Strong, Strong's 4191, and Shalak, in, once again, Strong. Strong is what uh, explains Hebrew, right? Now, the word Mut means to die in Hebrew, right? And the word shalak means to send. So mut is metu, mut means to die and shalak means to send. That's the name. The name Methuselah means when he dies, it will be sent. Right? When he dies, it will be sent. That's a strange name to give your son. Right? When he dies, it will be sent. Now immediately the question comes up. When he dies, what will be sent? The answer is very simple. When he dies, the flood of which God spoke to Enoch that he would, he would send uh, as a judgment would take place, right? Now, sig significantly Jewish tradition, very ancient Jewish tradition says that Matthew Salah died just 10 days before the flood. Now, we can't prove that from the Bible, right? That Matthew Salah died just 10 days before the flood. But we can confirm that he died the very year of the flood. How is that? Let's do a little math. I'm sure there are math, mathematicians out there. Okay, so the word muth means to die and the word shalak means to send, right? So it means he, when he dies, it shall be sent. Let's do some math. According to Genesis 5.25, from the time that Methuselah was born till the time his son Lamech was born, 187 years had passed. So in other words, Matthew Salah was 187 years old when his son Lamech was born, okay? Now his son Lamech was, was 182 years when his son Noah was born, okay? So Lamech was 182 years when his son Noah was born, Genesis 5, 28, if you want to check it out. Finally, we are told in Genesis 7, 11 that Noah was 600 years old when the flood came. So let's add up the figures. So you'll add 187 plus 182 plus 600, you get 969 years. Now, is that a significant uh, number for Matthew Sala? Yes, right? 
so from the time Matusala was born till the flood came, a period of 969 years transpired, right? And now how old was Matusala when he died? We find the answer in Genesis 5.27. It says there, so all the days of Matusala were 969 years and he died. Now, is that awesome? Unequivocally, uh, we were cold, sorry, without doubt, let me use an easy word without getting my tongue twisted in this scene. Matthew Salah died the very year of the flood. Thus, his name was prophetic. It announced the very year the world would be destroyed by the flood. So, Matthew Salah's name was the time prophecy. God called his prophet Enoch, gave him a message of judgment. Connected with the message of judgment was the time prophecy, his name of his son, but the message was not present to for Enoch's generation. Okay, is that clear? Right, now let's move on. Now, significantly, when this time prophecy was about to reach its end, God called another prophet to make the message of Enoch present truth. Of course, we know the name of the prophet because Noah. Now, did Noah make the message of Enoch present truth for his day and age? Notice what we are told about Noah in 2 Peter 2, 5 and Hebrews 11, 7. Someone likes to read that. And did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the wall of the ungodly. Hebrews 11, 7. Okay. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepare an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. So was Noah a prophet? Yes, right? Yes. Noah was a prophet. God gave Noah the same message he gave Enoch, right? Was the message of Enoch a message of judgment? Obviously, right? The flood was a message of judgment. Did the message of Noah culminate when the time prophecy came to an end? Yes. And Noah, uh, and did Noah make Enoch's message present truth for his day and age? Yes, right? Did Noah also through his leadership, save a remnant from destruction and draw them out. Absolutely, right? He saved eight people uh, with his, because of his preaching, right? Now that he saved, he, he, because he was instrumental in saving eight persons. Now, is that clear? Enoch's message that God gave him about the flood? Now, let's move on to the next one, a second example, right? In Genesis 27, we are told that Abraham went to the city of Gerar, uh, and it appears that Sarah, Abraham's wife, the Bible tells us, was a very beautiful woman, or even though she was old, right, at the time. So Abraham tells her, now, if, if, if they think, you know, the, the king Abimelech, if he thinks that you are my wife, he will kill me and take you, take you as his wife. So he say, tells Sarah, to tell Abimelech that she is his sister, right? It was a half truth, but a half truth is a full lie, right? We know that half truths are not part, part, uh, part true and part false. A half truth is still a full lie. So he told the, um, so he told him, um, uh, he he told him the truth, but not the whole truth and nothing but the truth, right? So Abraham didn't tell him the exact full truth. Fortunately that evening God gave Abimelech a dream, which is recorded in, in, recorded in the story of Genesis 20, verse seven. Someone likes to read Genesis 20, verse seven. Now therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he will pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you shall surely die. You and all who are yours. Okay, so now God reveals the whole truth and the complete truth to Abimelech. He explains that Sarah is Abraham's wife and Abraham was a prophet and condemned him to return, commanded him to return Sarah to her husband, right? God calls Abraham a prophet. Now, usually we don't think of Abraham as a prophet, 
but he was a prophet. God himself calls him a prophet. The question is, did God give Abraham a message of judgment linked with the time prophecy? The answer is yes. Let's look at it. It's found in Genesis chapter 15, verses 13 and 14. This is where we find the, the prophecy about the surgeon of the children of Israel in Egypt for 400 years. Let's read that. Then he said to Abraham, No, certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterward, they shall come out with great possessions. Okay. So did God give Abraham a message of judgment linked with the time prophecy? He certainly did, right? Now, was that message present truth for Abraham's day? Absolutely not, because Genesis 15, 16 tells us. Someone likes to read that, where, where we find that it was not present truth for Abraham's day. Genesis 15, verses 15 and 16. Now, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Okay. So was this prophecy for a distant period in the future? Obviously, 400 years, right? So once again, let's summarize this, this, um, uh, this, prophet, this message that God gave. God calls the prophet Abraham. He gave him a message of judgment. Linked with the message of judgment was a time prophecy, 400 years. But the message was not present truth for Abraham's generation. Okay, can we see the sequence of how God works, right? Now, at the end of this period, as it was nearing an end, the 400 years were about to end, did God raise up another prophet to make the message of Abraham present truth? So what was the name of the prophet? The name of the prophet was Moses. Moses. Now, did God uh, come in judgment in the days of Moses upon the nation that had afflicted Israel. Was the message of Abraham fulfilled? Were God's people delivered? They most certainly were, right? We have read that story over and over again. Now, in fact, we are told that on the very day, on the very day that the time prophecy came to an end, God delivered his people from the bondage uh, to the Egyptians. Let's read Exodus 12, 40 and 41. See, prophecy is very accurate. Right when you study the Bible. Let's read Exodus 12, 40 and 41. Now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Okay, now when I read that text, I don't know how many of you have wondered about the 30 years. 430, right? Now, um, one, one, uh, just, is there a, maybe we need to mute a mic, someone's mic. Okay. One has to do with the time in which Abraham was called to leave his home to go to Canaan, right? That is where the 30 years comes in. The other is when he finally entered Canaan, right? So we, will, we won't get into that right now, but that is where the 30 year is so-called discrepancies, one where Abraham's called from his home, so that adds the 30, uh, 30 extra years to what Exodus is telling us, right? Now, did Moses make the message of Abraham present truth? He most certainly did, right? Did Moses bring judgment after judgment through the power of God upon the Egyptian civilization? He most certainly did, right? If you read Exodus, we know that. Just as had been prophesied by Abraham, and so he did make that message that was given to Abraham, was given again to Moses, present truth for his time. So did God read, uh, lead out a remnant from Egypt? What was the remnant? The remnant was God's people. He led them out on the pilgrimage to the land of Canaan, right? So thus the message of Abraham became present truth in the generation of Moses. So Moses... 
uh, is specifically called a prophet in the Bible, just in case we were wondering. Hosea 12, 13 says, by a prophet, the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt and by a prophet, he was preserved. So Moses also is known as a prophet. Now that's our second example. Uh, notice that it was fulfilled in the to Old Testament. Once again, God operates in the same way. What does he do? He calls a prophet. He gives him a message connected with a time prophecy. The message is of judgment. And it is not for the time of the first prophet. Thus at the end, when the time prophecy is coming nearing an end, God calls up another prophet. He gives him the same message of judgment. And he says the time prophecy has... Um, has uh, is coming to an end and then the the prophet leads out god through the prophet leads out a remnant okay so are those two um two examples clear now let's go to a third example that is fulfilled in the old testament jeremiah and daniel isn't jeremiah cute there okay <laughs> just a side note would you agree that jeremiah was a prophet Jeremiah 1.5, in Jeremiah 1.5, we are told that Jeremiah was called to be a prophet while he was still in his mother's womb. Now, we are not going to read that because of time constraints. Was, the question is, the next question is, was Jeremiah given a specific time prophecy along with a message of judgment? Yes, indeed. Notice Jeremiah 25.11 to 12. Someone likes to read that? Jeremiah 25, 11 to 12. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass when 70 years are completed that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans for their iniquity, says the Lord and I will make it a perpetual desolation. Okay, did, give, did God give Jeremiah, the prophet, a message? He most certainly does, right? Was it a message of judgment? Absolutely, right? It, was it connected to a prime time prophecy? 70 years, right? Was it the message for the days of Jeremiah? No, Jeremiah died long before this time period came to an end, his prophecy was not fulfilled in his time. Now here, Jeremiah was told that the captivity of Judah in Babylon would last a period of 70 years after God, after that God would intervene to deliver Judah and take her back to the land of Israel. This was not present truth for the days of Jeremiah for he died before the captivity began and ended. Right? So it was not present truth for him. But now, near in the conclusion of the 70 years, God called another prophet to make the message of Jeremiah present truth. What was the name of that prophet? The prophet was Daniel. Now, this is immediately after Babylon has fallen, right? This is immediately, the, the text is immediately after Babylon has fallen. God had just judged Babylon the year before as he had promised. And now Daniel wondered whether God's people would go back to their land as promised. Let's read Daniel chapter nine, verses one and two. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the line age of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, his reign one. I, Daniel. Of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the, num the, by the books of, by the books, the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So what prophecy was Daniel study? Did it ever occur to you? When the Maya was... prophecy. Yes, did it ever occur to you that, you know, we, we have read this many times in scripture that Daniel was studying Jeremiah's 
prophecy, it, it never clicked, you know, it, at least to me, it never clicked till I read this because it was Jeremiah's message that God had called Daniel to make present truth for his time, right? So we find Daniel was studying the prophecy of the 70 years of Jeremiah because that prophecy was about to come to an end. Now, Babylon fell in 539 BC and the decree for God's people to go back was to be given in the year 536 BC. Now, Mrs. White describes a very interesting encounter between Daniel and Cyrus the Great. Now, Cyrus is the one who uh, came and defeated the um, Babylonians, right? Um, you know, Cyrus was also with Darius. Darius was the king, uh, the Medes, right? When the city of Babylon fell. And she says that when Cyrus entered the city, remember Daniel was called to uh, explain the handwriting on the wall. Daniel was at the banquet hall. We talked about the banquet hall, right? Uh, where we, where they used the holy vessels, right? And and then uh, ba Babylon fell. Daniel met Cyrus, and he and Mrs. White says she, it, it's found in um, where, where is it? I I checked it out today. Uh, it's okay now. I forgot. I will I will tell you later. He said to Cyrus that over a hundred years. Before he was born, his name was mentioned in scripture. Now we know that is um, found in Isaiah 41, verse 45, verse 1. And he showed him Isaiah 41, verse 1, written over 100 years before with the name of Cyrus, saying, Cyrus shall deliver my people and give the command for them to go and build the temple. So Daniel tells Cyrus, you are the man, your name is Cyrus. God has called you to give that decree. And just less than two years later, we find that Cyrus gave the decree for God's people to go back and build Jerusalem, right? Now, Cyrus gave that decree exactly 70 years after the captivity began. If you want to find out, it's found in Ezra 1, verses 1 to 4. So once again, let's do a summary. Does this follow the same modus operandi or mode of operation of God, you know? Uh, giving these huge time, important time prophecies, it follows the same pattern, right? As the first two that we discussed, God calls a prophet, he gives the prophet a message. It's a message of judgment. It's not present truth for that day and age. Connected with this message is a time prophecy. And at the end of the period, God calls another prophet. He gives him the same message. It's a message of judgment. The time period is now coming to an end and it, then it becomes present truth. Did Daniel lead a, rem, uh, lead a remnant out of Babylon and uh, help them go back to their land? Yes, right, Dan, though Daniel didn't go, Daniel, uh, uh, you know, worked in a way that it uh, helped Nehemiah and them to lead out uh, this a remnant to go back. Um, to Israel out of captivity, just the way God had said was going to happen, right? Now, are you finding this very interesting? I found it extremely interesting. Now, let's go to another example. Now, this example is fulfilled in the New Testament, right? The prophecy is given in the Old Testament, but the events prophesied were fulfilled in the New Testament. Now, once again, we have Daniel. Daniel is an important prophet for, for the next ones. Uh, Prophet Daniel gave a prophecy which we already studied in this series. Remember the 70-week prophecy? Uh, and um, there were three great events in the prophecy of the 70 weeks, if you remember. Uh, and that particularly took place in the last week of the 70 um, years, according to the, according to, right, and the 69, the, seven, the last seven uh, years of that 70-year prophecy. So let's read about that and review what those three main points are. And here is the prophecy, Daniel 9, 24 to 27. Now someone likes to read that. 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem 
until messiah the prince there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks the street shall be built again and the wall even in trouble sometimes and after the 62 weeks messiah shall be cut off but not for himself and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary the end of it shall be with a flood and till the end of the war desolations and are determined then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering and on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate okay now who was it that came to jerusalem and destroyed jerusalem because of the rejection of the messiah we studied that um the the jewish theocracy ended because the nation of israel rejected the messiah right it was rome specifically the armies of titus right we have studied that so we will not spend time on that much today so the first event in the last week of um, the 70 year prophecy the first event is the anointing of the messiah the second event is his death right in the middle of that seven week period three and a half years after his anointing jesus did this literally to the day remember we studied that literally to the day and the third event is the close of probation for the nation that rejected him right which led to the destruction of babylon right so national apostasy leads to national ruin right so the nation of israel apostatized right they didn't accept jesus so it was led to national ruin at the end of this period actually during the last week of this period did god call another prophet during the last during the last seven years of this 70 year period did god call another prophet to make this message of daniel present truth for his day and age he did the name is up there so i know all of you will say it um it was john the baptist right notably at the very beginning of the last seven years john the baptist made the message of daniel present truth by addressing exact same issues that were given in the 70 year prophecy was jesus anointed we have studied this before remember first of all john the baptist baptized and introduced jesus right it was at his baptism that jesus was anointed as the messiah right uh, matthew 3 15 16 and 17 shall we read that then jesus came from galilee to john at the jordan to be baptized by him when he had been baptized Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of god descending like a dove and in alighting upon him and suddenly a voice came from heaven saying this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased let's review Uh, you remember that in uh, Luke four sixteen, Jesus begins his ministry in Nazareth. This is soon after his uh, his uh, wilderness experience, and he says, "The Lord has anointed me." Now, this is immediately after his baptism, right? When Jesus was baptized, but fell upon him the Holy Spirit, right, in the form of a dove, descended on Christ. Now, when you go to Acts two thirty nine. and 38 and 39 peter affirms that god anointed jesus with the holy spirit and so the anointing of jesus took place at the moment of his baptism when he received the holy spirit now did john address the issue of anointing of the messiah yes he did he was involved in the anointing of the messiah right because he baptized him now another question how did john introduce jesus when um, Uh, Jesus what did he say in John 1:29 and verse 
The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Okay. Now, uh, any Jew, any good Jew, would know what a lamb means, right? The lamb in the sanctuary service. Lambs were killed in the sanctuary services. Did Jesus die on the cross? They knew exactly what uh, the lamb represented. Jesus died on the cross as the lamb of God. Was he the lamb slain from the mouth foundations of the world? Yes. So John the Baptist didn't understand fully, right? All the implications of this. But when he introduced Jesus as the lamb of God, he was saying that he was going to die. Okay. So when John the Baptist announced, even though he didn't understand that the, the, that the death of Jesus Christ, he was announcing the truth that Daniel spoke of in the 70 weeks, the end, the last um, seven years of the 70 week prophecy, right? Jesus was anointed that he called him the Lamb of God, which was talking about his death. Now, did John the Baptist also warn the Jewish nation that if they don't shake up, right, that their probation would close? Notice Matthew um, 3, 7 to 12. Now, this is a bit long, but we will read the whole thing because John the Baptist proclaimed the message of judgment. Incidentally, Jesus' death on the cross was also a message of judgment, right? It was a judgment for the devil and it was a judgment against sin, right? So it, John, when he uh, presented, introduced Jesus as a lamb of God, he was uh, presenting it as a judgment for the devil and uh, sin. Now let's read um, how John announced the third event, the judgment that would fall upon the Jewish nation, because that was the third event that took place at, in the last um, seven years of the 70-year uh, prophecy. Matthew 3, verses 7 to 12. Someone likes to read that? But... When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath, of, wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. And even now, the axis lay to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His Winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but he will burn up the shelf with unquenchable fire. Now, brood of, uh, John the Baptist was not political correct, right? He called them a brood of vipers, which actually described them pretty well. Uh, that was a same name that Jesus gave them in Matthew 23. Now, what did the tree represent? Uh, in the context, it re in, in this context, he says, therefore, every tree that does not bear fruit. In, in this context, it represents the Jewish nation, right? Now, what happened to Jerusalem in the year AD 70? It was burnt, just like John the Baptist said. Now, notice the message of judgment uh, in his winnowing fan, when he says his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. Isn't that a judgment message? He's weeding out the, the dross and collecting the good, right? The weed. But he will burn up, burn up the chef, chef with unquenchable fire. Is this a message of judgment? It obviously is, right? That God is going to separate the righteous from the unrighteous. Those who produce fruit and those who don't produce fruit, right? So John gives this message. Now, it's also worthy to note three years after John the Baptist began preaching, two and a half years after Jesus began his ministry. John began it six months before Jesus, right? Jesus told his following, 
uh, parable, right? Uh, we, we also meet this uh, tree later in Jesus' ministry. Uh, in, in the last week of his life in Matthew 21, 19, right? Talks about the fig tree. Remember John the Baptist said the tree needs to produce fruit. If it doesn't produce fruit, it will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Now notice Matthew 21, verse 19. What does Jesus say? And when he saw a fig tree in the way, he came to it and found nothing thereon, but leaves only, and said unto it, Let no fruit grow on thee, henceforward forever. Okay. Now, all scholars, most of everybody, right? All, all biblical scholars, dispensationalists, futurists, whatever they are, they all agree that the fig tree represents the Jewish nation, right? Um, and it, the fig, if, if fig tree is talking about the Jewish nation. Now, the very next day, Jesus and his disciples passed by the site where this tree was and discovered that it had dried up. Let's read Mark 11, 20 and 21. Now in the morning, as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dry up from the roots. And Peter, remembering, said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree which you curse has withered away. Now, this was the, the last week of Jesus' ministry, right? John spoke about the tree before. So the Jews had a full seven years to get the act together if they hadn't had that together the 70 years, right? Now, did John the Baptist make the message of the 70 years present truth? He certainly did, right? Particularly the last three events in the last week, okay? He absolutely did. He was the one who baptized the Messiah. When the Messiah was anointed, he was the one who anoint, announced Jesus, the Lamb of God, would take away the sins of the earth. And he, and he announced that if the Jewish nation did not bear fruit, it would be cut down and thrown to the fire, which is exactly what happened in the year AD 70. The Jewish nation was destroyed and Jerusalem was burned with fire. Did John the Baptist, through his work, bring out a remnant? Yes, he brought out the Christian church, right? So John the Baptist, uh, were, uh, who was more than a prophet, right? John the Baptist was more than a prophet, preached a message of judgment, made, it, uh, the, made the time prophecy of the 70 weeks present truth in his generation. He also prepared the nucleus of those who would become the disciples of Jesus and the founders of the Christian church, right? Do, do you know that most of the disciples of Jesus had previously been disciples of John the Baptist? That is why it was so easy for them to accept the Messiah, right? Have you ever wondered that? Wondered about that? I don't know whether you were aware of that or not. And those disciples became the disciples of Jesus. That is why when Jesus called them, they dropped everything they needed. They were, they were doing and they followed him because they had heard the message from John before, right? And they, the disciples of Christ became the nucleus and the founders of what the Christian church, of the Christian church. Uh, they were the remnant that founded the Christian church, but they were the first, but they first of all were drawn out by John the Baptist. Now, did you see uh, the, the, Parallels between the three. Now we come to the final. Now let's go to our last example, right? We studied, remember the prophecy of the 2,300 days? The 2,300 days are the larger prophecy, the Shazon, right? The 70 weeks for the, the right of, uh, of the um, were part, the ones that cut off the part, you know, that began, that gave um, the beginning date for the 2,300 uh, Day prophecy, right? The first part of it. I'm sure that you remember that. Now, the interesting thing is that Daniel not only gave the prophecy of the 70 weeks, which applied to the literal Jewish nation, but he also spoke about the 2,300 days that would be fulfilled way down the course of Christian history, right? Daniel 8, 14 uh, tells us, and he said to me for 2,300 days, and then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. Now that was not present truth for Daniel's time by 
any stretch of imagination, 2,300 years, right? Now, according to Daniel 12, 4, verse 9 and 13, this prophecy was not present truth for Daniel's day. How do we know it? Someone likes to read that? But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will in shall increase. And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. But you go your way till the end, for you shall rest and shall arise to your inheritance at the end of the days. Okay, so it was not present truth for Daniel, because Daniel died before it was fulfilled. Now let's summarize again. To whom is God giving the message? To Daniel, right? Was Daniel a prophet? He most certainly was one of the major prophets, right? Is God connecting uh, with the message a time prophecy? Yes, the longest time prophecy, that right? 2,300 days. Is it a message of judgment? Obviously, it's talking about the cleansing of the sanctuary, right? We studied that. It refers to the beginning of the judgment in the heavenly sanctuary. Was this message of judgment for Daniel's day? Absolutely. Not as we just read. Now, when they say knowledge shall increase, it's not talking about scientific knowledge or any knowledge. It's it's talking about the knowledge of this 2,300 day prophecy. Many Adventist pastors and scholars get that wrong. They talk about uh, you know missing past and satellites and uh, planes and all that is not what the Bible is saying. In context, um, with the study of Daniel, you find that when God says knowledge shall increase, men shall run to and fro, is the knowledge of the 2300 day prophecy, right? That was given to Daniel. That is what it's talking about, right? That became present truth for that, that time. Now, so this message was not present truth in Daniel's time. Now, here's the billion dollar question. Would we expect at the end of the 2300 days for God to raise up a prophet who will proclaim the same message that Daniel proclaimed, make it present truth for his or her day and age? Yes, it is because that's how God operates, right? We saw the five, four, the four previous uh, time prophecies that God gave for the salvation of uh, uh, mankind, right? So at the end of the 2,300 days, we would expect God to raise a prophet that would explain the prophecy of the 2,300 days, that it had come to an end and explain the prophecy explicitly. Now, leading up to the year 1844, as we have studied before, God raised up an interdenominational, intercontinental movement known as the Great Second Advent Awakening. It was also known as the Millerite movement, right? And what was the central verse that they preached leading up to October 22, 1844? It was Daniel 8, 14, unto 2,300 days, and the sanctuary shall be cleansed. When were the 2,300 days fulfilled? They were fulfilled in 1844. Would you expect a movement to arise that would proclaim the 2,300 days? Uh, were about to come to an end? Absolutely, because that is how God operates. That is how it had happened before, right? That is the way it had happened in every single case before. Now, listen carefully. William Miller didn't fully understand one thing. He didn't understand the event that was going to take place. Now, John the Baptist also didn't understand fully the event, right? Uh, but he was correct so to the timing. Right? He was correct about the time. He was not, uh, he didn't understand the event that was going to, uh, to, to take place, but he was correct as to the timing of the event, right? He was wrong, uh, wrong on the event, but right on the time. Now, before you get too hard on William Miller, before we, you need to remember that John the Baptist, like I said, said was the prophet who arose at the end of the 70 weeks, was in the same boat because he didn't understand either. Um, understand it either and afterwards after the disappointment at the triumphal entry uh, the disciples further study right and understood and Peter on the day of Pentecost God's prophet explained what happened right so even the disciples were right on the time but they didn't understand the event they thought Jesus was going to raise up a kingdom on earth 
right? They didn't understand the event, but they knew the time, right? So William Miller and the Millerites, they had the timing right, but they had the event wrong. Now, after the great disappointment, God called and commissioned Ellen White, she was then Harmon, to fully explain this prophecy. And in all of Mrs. White's early visions, her burden was to explain the prophecy of the 2,300 days and the reason for the great disappointment. She would, could have written about many subjects. Why did she have the burden to explain the prophecy of the 2,300 days? Simply because she was making it present truth, the time prophecy that God had given 2,300 days before, present truth for her time. And Ellen White, we all know, became the founder of the Remnant Church. Now, what if Ellen White had talked about many other things? Maybe she talked about the Trinity, about the health, about how important establishing an educational system, or how, uh, you know, those would be, you know, you know, organization of the church. Now, those would have been beautiful and wonderful truths, but they would never have made, they could not have made the 2,300-day pro prophecy present truth for her time. She had to address the same issue, the identical issue that Daniel had addressed, and that's exactly what she did. Listen carefully, Mrs. White gathered a small remnant. In fact, her first publication was a word to the little flock scattered abroad. And in that booklet, she tries to explain what happened in 1844 and the reason for the great disappointment. Right. Now, many movements to happen around 1844, right? Now, this happened in New England during the Second Advent, Great Advent of Ickening, uh, came to be known as the, as the burned over district that was New England, right? Because many of the movements that arose during that, arose during that time in that same uh, geographical location. Now, following are some of the movements and their champions who rose around this period, both in, the, both in the United States and in Europe. Um, in the same area, Mormonism with its prophet Joseph Smith, Christian science with its prophetess Mary Baker Eddy, Theosophy, uh, New Age Theology, Helena Blavatsky. The Baha'i faith originated at that time with its prophet Abdul Baha. Spiritualism originated in that same general area, the Fox sisters and Andrew Jackson Davis, right? Pentecostalism had its origins with a woman named Margaret MacDonald. The Jehovah's Witnesses within that time frame had their origin with Charles Taze Russell. The futuristic interpretation of Bible prophecy had its origins then with John Nelson Darby and Edward Irving. Evolutionism had its origin at that same time, 1844, right? In the time frame with Charles Darwin. Marxism, which is the philosophy of communism, had its origin during that time frame with Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Now, why do you suppose the devil was trying to do, what, what do you suppose the devil was trying to do with so many religious movements arising at the same, in the same general log, geographical location at the same time? People will wonder where is the truth? Where should we turn? Now, do, how, do you know how you can know where the truth is? And how can we be sure that none of those movements were genuine manifestations of God's remnant? Simply because none of them addressed or even showed any interest in the prophecy of the 2,300 days. They all had a central message, but it had nothing to do with the 2,300 days and 1844. So none of those that we mentioned just now uh, prophesied down to 2,300 days and then the sanctuary would be cleansed, shall be cleansed. Would you expect that to happen at the end of the, at the, end of the 2,300 days in harmony with God's mode of operation? Absolutely. You just studied it and you can check history, right? So in contrast, the Millerites, and Mrs. White, their central message on, was on this prophecy. Ellen White thus became the founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church and God's remnant with a special judgment message 
for the last days. Now that is the commission for you and I, right? Now the prophet to the end church, the attitude to Mrs. White. Now there are different attitudes to Mrs. White. Some openly attack her ministry and writing or they read them with an agenda, right? Every prophet in the Bible we know was hated by people to whom the prophet was sent. So if Ellen White is dis disliked in many circles, I would safely say she's probably the true prophet, right? Because Jesus said the prophets who were liked were false prophets because prophets tell the truth that people can't handle the truth. Others ignored her by not reading her counsel, right? They are not benefited. Others undermined her through selective use of her writings. When it was convenient for them, they used her. Others using her to pound people over the head. And that is why many people don't want anything to do with her. You cannot pound them on the head with Mrs. White. Mrs. White is the last resort given to, the, to a believer. You don't give Mrs. White to a non-believer, right? <laughs> because that is pounding them on the head. Others love, read, and obey the counsels of God that God gave through her. Now, allow me to say, Ellen White does not say anything weird or wacky or off the wall. Her counsels are magnificent. They deal with many different areas, health, education, church organization, theology, pious living. Just read for yourself. You'll be amazed at how God used this remarkable woman to share the truth for these last days. And I thank God personally for this wonderful gift of prophecy that we see in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm.